um, was probably retyped in from what he can tell. He then went through all, you know, uploaded to their big mainframe that drives these, you know, hundred-year-old, you know, movable pipe, you know, things. Um, uh, and he had to submit all of his uh, editorial changes with red pen on paper. Um, when he went to do the second edition, he said, well, give me the, the text back so I can, you know, edit it. They said, oh, you wouldn't be able to read our mainframe files. He said, well, how am I going to do the second edition? They said, well, just, you know, submit the changes like you were before, you know, red circles, and if you have a new chapter to add, you know, give us the new chapter. And he said, I'm not doing a new chapter. I'm not doing a second edition. He, he can't do a second edition because his text is in some mainframe someplace. So that's, that's the publishing horror story. Yeah. So our, our contract um, actually explicitly says that we will get back an electronic copy that it is that is editable and so this thrilled my lawyer because he had never seen these terms. You know, in, in, you know, acceptable formats include, you know, LaTeX, blah, 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 blah. N unacceptable formats include, you know, Word. PDF. <laughs> you know, actually, we would, we would have settled for Word because at least, you know, it's better than PDF. Yeah. Um, or other formats that are mutually agreed to. So that's an issue. But, did, did, did yes? Did you get access to your CBS repository in any form? Um, we would have offered it if our publisher was that technical. Um, but, you know, your, your editor is more like, um, uh, book editors today are more like uh, recruiters for sports teams. They go to conferences, they try to find book ideas, and then they manage the project. Um, the editing itself was done by, you know, a, a professional proofreader. The formatting is done by a formatting house. So, well, just saying, it would be the perfect thing to take this naive customer mm -hmm. and show them how to do this new thing. <laughs> yeah, I think the, uh, the authors that she works with are technical enough. One thing we did do is instead of um, emailing the, the chapters to her, we would put them up on a website and we gave her a password. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Actually, I'll talk about that at the end of this slide. Um, so I've talked forever about CBS, but the CBS server was on a Solaris box, um, globally accessible through the internet, which you know is nothing to us, but to the non-technical audience, it's like, wow, that's amazing. We access it through SSH, um, you know, the only way to communicate nowadays. Um, and we were the first bulk of the book was written on uh, Linux. Um, uh, with some Solaris, it depends on, technically I wasn't writing the book at work, but there was the occasional checkout to a Solaris machine at work where I'd work on it. Um, and Windows. But one of the powerful things about open protocols is if you are unhappy with your vendor, you can change. And so um, we could have moved the Solaris uh, CDS repository to another machine if we had to. We did move the clients. Um, there was a... a a period where Christine did not have any Linuxness at home, and she needed to be able to write from home. So we had uh, the CBS client for uh, Windows is quite exceptional, and so that was um, we were able, she was able to switch to a, a Windows client midway through. Now think about that doing that for many applications. Oh, halfway through the project, we're going to change operating systems. That would kill some projects, but you can do that if you stick with open protocols. Um, let's see. And I also switched to Windows for a part because I couldn't get uh, power management working on Linux. And for me to write, if if I do, if I have to begin my day writing or nothing gets done, because once I'm on a net on a network-based computer, I have so many distractions that I cannot write. So I literally had to wake up and be able to open my laptop and have it um, be, you know, have it, it has to have been in sleep mode, so when it comes up, there's VI and I'm just editing. Because in the time it would take to boot, I would get a distraction and boom, you know, I'm not writing. So I couldn't get power management working on Linux, so I got VI for Windows and CVS client for Windows, and so a lot of the book I wrote early in the morning in, in Windows. Um, but. So I'm, in some ways, I feel guilty that you know, this somewhat Unix-centric book was, um, 
not all written on Unix. On the other hand, I think this demonstrates the, the power of open, uh, open protocols and open source. <coughs> so, LaTeX, talk about LaTeX, talk about Apache that we, um, we gave documents to non-technical people, um, people that couldn't access our repository, we put them up on a web server. Um, we hate faxes, so the faxing that we, there were some situations where we just had images that had to be sent around and we would scan them and um, put them in the repository, then email a notification. Um, and of course, IETF open standards for email. This is less of an issue now, but when we started writing on the book, there were still um, many corporations that were not using you know, SMTP for email. And in fact, depending on if you consider Exchange to be SMTP or not, there are many companies that are still not doing that. Um, was there a hand up? Yes. I, uh, Page here, but when uh, they did the, the last of the four four BSD manuals, they actually wrote a paper about how hard indexing was. Um, how good is MakeIndex? MakeIndex is okay. Um, Ask actually hired a professional indexer to read the book and make the index. Um, which we tried to cross check. I think it's a it's a good index. I wouldn't say it's a fantastic index. Um, it's really hard for a third party to index. Um, we kept doing, with an 800 page book, basically you have to do pop quizzes. Well, you know, what's a topic? And then you look it up in the index and make sure that they got that right. But I know yesterday I wanted to look up the, the Lucky Bucks anecdote and um, I couldn't find it in the index. So, um, Oh, actually, you know, I haven't mentioned the anecdotes yet. This is something we have to add to the presentation. So another really, well, something I'm very proud about uh, in this book is that instead of saying, well, is that it's filled with really cool stories. I learned Unix from a mentor. I didn't learn it from a book. I learned it from a mentor who told the story of Unix and how these commands follow these commands. And, and there's history. And I think a lot of us learn system administration not out of a book, but through a good mentor who tells you these stories and anecdotes. And we, uh, I talk to I, I have friends that are anthropologists, and they say that the way that a society passes, passes knowledge from generation to generation is through the stories that they tell. And so it was very important to us to have this be a storybook. So there's all these little gray boxes where we tell us we tell stories, and these are real anecdotes that happen. We did not have, every single one of them was verified to be true. So we make a point, and then we tell an anecdote that proves the point. Um, and, um, and that makes the book interesting. One of our reviewers said that uh, he promised himself he would just read to the end of the chapter, but then all of a sudden he realized it was 3 a.m. and he had read four more chapters, and gosh, I would never say that about a Java book. <laughs> And that, was the, that was the review that made it all worthwhile because, you know, that, that was the point of the book. We wanted this to capture all those great anecdotes that helped us learn that we got from mentors. So, um, people here are, I assume, familiar with SSH. Um, one of the nice things about SSH that a lot of people don't know about is you can set up cryptographic key pairs that um, let you let one machine talk to another without having to enter a password. So, and also, key pairs that are only allowed to execute certain commands on the other side. So I have a special key that I install on any machine that should be able to check in documents to the repository as me. And I have a different key that just gives read-only access to the repository. These kind of things um, really helped us in the book because I don't trust many computers. So there were certain places where I just was doing proofreading and I would just need read-only access. Um, let's see. And I've really covered all that. I've talked about the benefits of open protocols being the ability to change clients. Um, the other thing that I learned during writing this book was SIGWIN. Um, SIGWIN gives you all the Unix commands on a Windows environment. And it's fantastic. I mean, the first time I piped the output of one thing to another, 
Oh, on a Windows <laughs> box. Oh, and then I catted a file and piped it to SSH and ran the command that was going to process it on another machine. And I said, oh my god, I'm doing this on a Windows box. This is great. And then I was upgrading from one machine to another and I needed to copy a lot of data and I did a tar on one Windows box and SSH, I said send the output to standard output and piped this to SSH to a different Windows box and on that Windows box I untarred and oh, now I was really in heaven. Um, it can be slow but it's getting faster every you know, revision. Um, but boy, if you're not using Sigwin and you're using Windows, you're, you're working too hard. And it's, yes, it's one of the best X Windows implementation. Um, and it's great. It just works. You take a bit of source code from a Linux or Solaris box and type make and it compiles. It's hallelujah. Is it free? And it's free. Yes. You go to sigwin.com and it even has a good installer program. So why didn't Tom use this Sigwin about two years early? Well, because I'm lazy and I figure, oh, I hate installing things. It's always such a pain in the ass and building the source and everything. And then I finally said, well, I really need to use this, so I installed it. Oh, they have this great installer and it FTP stuff and it's pre-compiled. There's, oh, should have done it years ago. It wasn't always that good. I, I guess that I must have started using Sigwin the day after their cool new install system um, was released because I, it, to me, it's, I've been using it forever, but people on the cutting edge like yourself are like, oh, you should have seen it when it was new. <laughs> <laughs> and while this book is agnostic about technology and what operating system is the best, because we all know the best operating system is whatever is right for that given application, our server always stayed on Unix because we're Unix hogs. Um, there's something called Telme instead of uh, you know, the open SSH. It's a DOS-based SSH client, and yeah. people have minimal, so they, you know, they just needed to get in the mm -hmm. server. I just installed um, Telme. It's a Russian-made T E L I N E. You just, you just FTP. And how is that spelled? T E L N E A T. Telme. Oh, okay. Um, Great. It's an SSH client, but it doesn't give you SCP ability. There were people that needed both. I basically give them Win SCP or SCP Explorer, yeah. and that would give them the SCP side. When SCP is good, um, Putty is good. Yeah. Putty got a lot better recently. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, what's the other thing? Um, was there a question? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. There's some good. Um, when we were writing this, there weren't any good SSH version two implementations for Windows. So um, when the security holes were announced about version one, um, we basically had no alternative other than uh, Sigwin open SSH. So some of the non-software. Secure CRT. Oh. Secure CRT, yes. Um, that's actually what I use most of the time is Secure CRT. Why didn't I think of that? Um, it's not secure on the machine itself. It's as secure as that machine. Um, I wouldn't run the daemon. And when I copied files from one machine to another, I was only running the daemon for as long as I was doing that copy. Um, yeah, yeah. Though, uh, a nice thing about Sigwin is you can cat Etsy password and it sort of generates it out of the Windows registry and stuff. I mean, <laughs> these, these guys are nuts. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, and, oh, and, and they hacked CD. So if you CD to A colon, it does the right thing. Um, anyway, non-software tools. So the whole beginning of this presentation was about how system administration is about all those soft skills and negotiation and stuff. Um, and this is where we talk about it. And this is the part of the presentation where the heroine discusses the soft tools. So delegation. Um, we really wanted to focus on the writing and find people that were better than us do the other things. Um, so editing, proofreading, data entry was done by other people. Uh, data entry included paying a friend, I think, $10 an hour to take the reviews that we would get back. And she had CVS access. And she would, um, if it was an obvious correction, she would make it. If it was a non-obvious correction, she would add a LaTeX comment with 
you know, reviewer so and so says, you know, this paragraph sucks, or you should rearrange these sentences, and she would.